Next uh, talk is um, from James Haythamthwaite from SIK Consulting, uh, entitled The Impact of Indicator Interpolant Threshold Values on Resource Estimation. Bear with me, I'm operating the slides with this and then separate notes on my laptop. If I get out of sync, if, it, if what I'm saying doesn't make sense, then, then let me know. <laughs> okay, so um, basically uh, today I'm going to talk about um, indicator interpolants and specifically one of the parameters which is used to adjust indicator interpolants, which is the threshold value or ISO value. Um, the reason I want to talk about this is because indicator interpolants are being used more frequently to domain resource estimates, and the threshold value has quite a significant impact on particularly the tonnage of the resulting models. And giving it, given its significance, I don't think that it currently receives enough attention. So the aim, and I'm not on the right slide, so, and the, <laughs> so, the, so the aim of the presentation is to basically um, introduce indicator interpolants um, explain what the threshold value is, or the ISO value, um, show the impact of changes to the threshold value on the tonnage and grade of indicator models, and then briefly introduce, if I have time, some methods for determining how to set the threshold value. So, cool. All right, so in the context of what we're discussing today, um, indicator interpolants are basically a technique used to generate volumetric wireframes. They're most frequently used to generate uh, outlines for mineral resource estimates, so essentially um, domains that constrain the limits of a block model and then the data to be interpolated into the blocks. Um, they work in a similar way to grade shells in that they're based on 3D spatial interpolation of numeric data from drilling or, or elsewhere and then a subsequent delineation of a, of a wireframe which um, encapsulates interpolated points above a, a defined cutoff. The, the difference between indicator interpolants and sort of regular grade shells is that um, conventional grade shells involve um, direct interpolation of the original assay data or the original numeric data, whereas um, an indicator interpolant um, is based on a binary format. So, so if you are doing an indicator interpolant of assay data for resource domaining, then you select a cutoff, a cutoff grade, and then all data above the cutoff grade will be converted to ones, and all data below the cutoff will be converted to zeros, and then those ones and zeros are interpolated into space, and the shell, a grade shell, placed around um, the points that are above a threshold value or ISO value. So the terms that I'm using here, indicator interpolant and ISO value, relate to LeapFrog. Um, I'm using that terminology because LeapFrog is the software that I do almost all of my modeling in. But you could do indicator interpolation. Um, you could easily replicate it in, in pretty much any software that has the ability to generate implicit grade shells. Um, so just some quick, just as a, a sort of a visual demonstration. So. So basically the, the image on the left there is the, the original assay data, and then that would be converted to ones and zeros based on a cutoff grade. So I think that one uses a cutoff grade of 0.4. Anything above the cutoff grade is red, and anything below the cutoff grade is blue. So that's the, the ones and zeros in the image on the right. Um, then, uh, I mean, in this example, the, there's some trend surfaces that we've used to sort of guide the interpolation, but essentially those those one and zero values are then interpolated and a surface is generated which encapsulates the, the interpolated values in space above the threshold value that you define. So, um, yeah. so indicator interpolants are used um, in inf increasing frequency for domaining purposes in mineral resource estimates. And that's um, largely because um, all, the, all the advantages that are associated with conventional grade shells, um, which, you know, the, the amount of geological control that you can include, the fact that you can run multiple iterations with different interpretations and so on. Um, but 
separate to, to sort of conventional grade shells, because the, the data is essentially coded as in or out, um, in a strict sense, the shells typically better reflect the input assay data at the drill hole scale compared to conventional grade shells. And also, um, the, the impact of very high grades, which um, are often manifested as blowouts, uh, we call them blowouts, so large sort of additional volumes that in, in conventional grade modeling um, is completely, um, completely negated by indicator interpolants um, because you don't have those high grade um, assays, the, everything's one or zero. So um, I should probably stress now that uh, indicator interpolants are only really appropriate for deposits that have relatively close drill hole spacing and they don't work well at all for thin discrete mineralization styles just like grade shells and using this technique um, when not really appropriate or with little understanding of how it works can result in quite a, a badly wrong model. <laughs> Inappropriate model, that's probably a better way of saying it. So, um, so yeah, as I, as I mentioned, the ISO value is um, basically the value that's used to define the shell after the interpolation of ones and zeros into space. It has to be between zero and one. So, uh, as an example, if we have an ISO value of 0 0.5, then the shell will encapsulate all interpolated space with an interpolated value of zero, more than 0 0.5. So, why am I so concerned about the ISO value? Well, basically most, um, well, yeah, most indicator interpolant models are highly sensitive to the selected ISO value. Um, typically, the impact of the ISO value will far outweigh the impact of other parameters, such as the range, nugget, degree of anisotropy, and others, which we put a lot of attention to and usually detail, uh, describe in detail in, in our reports. Um, the ISO value doesn't often receive the same consideration, despite the fact that uh, small changes to this parameter can result in quite large changes to the resulting tonnage and grade of the model. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next slide. So yeah, often in the absence of, of mining reconciliation data to compare against the model, um, the ISO value might be determined based on visual assessment of which which iteration or which ISO value looks the most reasonable. So um, this, is, this is an image of, a, of an indicator interpolant shell. Um, the red points are uh, all of the assay data that's above cutoff, so they're assigned a value of one, and the blue points are all the input assays below the selected cutoff, and the black outline is the, the outline of the shell. That's at a, an ISO value of um, 0 0.3. So, as I said, often you know, people will, will make a visual assessment as to how to define the ISO value. So, so this is 0 0.3. This is the same model with the same controls, everything exactly the same apart from an ISO value of 0 0.4. The same model with an ISO value of 0 0.5 and 0 0.6. And this one um, it looks a bit messy, but basically it's, um, it's, this is basically the same section showing all of the indicator interpolant shells that we just looked at but also with additional increments in there at, at 0 0.05. So, the, so the, um, the blue shell would be an ISO value of 0 0.3, and the red shell or the pink shell would be 0 0.65. So, and I changed the colors of the assays, so the, the black assays are, are above cutoff and the gray assays are below cutoff this time, just to make it easier to see. Um, I think if we, if we went around this room and asked everyone to determine what an appropriate ISO value to select would be, just based on visual assessment of those shells, there'd probably be quite a large range of, um, of selected ISO values. Um, now, this, I changed the numbers. I, I've, I've multiplied things so that you can't tell that what, what the project is. And, uh, but anyway, the point is that, that basically these are the, the volumes and, and average grades of the, the shells that we've just looked at for each ISO value. So what we can see is that despite um, all the iterations appearing to be quite similar, there are significant changes in volume with ISO value, uh, which in this case results in a tripling of volume between a 0.65 ISO value and a 0.3 ISO value. Um, there are less, well, significantly actually, there are less significant changes in the average contained grade, uh, which means that the contained metal is greatly increased from the, in, well, greatly increased in the lower ISO values relative to the to the higher ISO values. Um, 
Yeah, okay. So yeah, this is a, these are basically just three examples of similar projects um, where I've, I've done the same, the same sort of thing. Um, and this just shows that the volume, th this is a, a consistent thing. It's not just for the, for the one project that I, that I tried it out on. Um, the, the sort of, the, the contained metal, uh, so the, the effect or the significance of this is varies from project to project. But in all cases, there's quite a significant change in contained metal. And always, the volume changes much more dramatically than the, than the grade changes. So, what is the reason for the differences in the model volume? And what, why, oh sorry, why is the model volume so much more significant, uh, the changes, than the differences in the average grade between each ISO value? Um, so simply put, it's because the indicator interpolant shells are very well constrained, or, or quite well constrained, at the position of the drill holes, but more poorly constrained as you move away from drilling. And that means that all of the ISO value iterations are quite similar on the drill holes, um, but as you move away from the drill holes, they become less similar. And that can result in a pinch and swell effect, basically where um, low ISO value um, for the model, but if you had a low ISO value, then the model would pinch on the drill holes and swell away from the drill holes. And the opposite is true for, for high ISO values. So we can see in the, in the image below, um, the, the black outline is a, is a low ISO value, and the pink outline is a high ISO value. Um, both of these are quite similar on the drill holes. So there's, there's, th these are the drill holes, by the way. These are the assay grades. Well, not the, 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 the sort of ones and zeros that are input. And you can see that on the drill holes, the, there's, not a, there's not a great difference between the, between the models. It's when you move away from the drill holes that, the, that you get a significant difference in the volume. And that's why the grade is similar between these two models, because it's, in, it's using similar assay data. There's not a great difference on the drill hole, but the volume is quite different. So, um, we're getting a bit sort of into possibly too much detail here, but, but basically just to, um, <laughs> just to prove that that pinch and swell effect is real, um, I basically completed an exercise where I calculated the, the volume of each ISO value within a five meter buffer of the drill holes and compared that with the total volume of the ISO value shell. So, basically um, what that shows is that um, the change in volume between the models is at different ISO values is much less pronounced close to the drill holes than it is away from the drill holes. So the when you're near oops sorry so when you're near the drill holes the changes are from one ISO value to the next within five meters of the drill holes the changes in volume are you know five percent six percent away from the drill holes the changes in volume are much larger. So the main difference in volume is the is away from the drilling not on it. Um, Okay, so what does all this mean? So, well, basically, we can show that because of the pinch and swell effect I've just discussed, the assays included in the indicator interpolant shell at each ISO value don't differ greatly, but the volumes are quite significantly different. And that means that if you have an ISO value that's too low, then you're interpolating your drill hole assays into an overinflated volume, and you're overestimating your resource tonnage. And if you have an ISO value that's too high, then you're interpolating your assays into a deflated volume, and you'd have an underestimated tonnage. What's next? Okay, yeah, so yeah, I don't really have um, a great deal of time, I don't think, to go into <laughs> methods, uh, methods that can be used to select an appropriate ISO value. But briefly, you can, I can sort of describe the following sort of idea. So if you're at a very early stage of exploration or an early stage and have quite a wide drill spacing, then uh, I would suggest that indicator interpolants are probably not a good idea. Uh, and it may be better to employ a more manual modeling approach. Um, if the project's in production, then really the selection of an appropriate ISO value is quite easy and should just be governed by selecting a, a model which best reconciles against the production. Uh, it's where you've got sufficiently close space drilling and uh, an appropriate mineralization style, um, but no possibility to reconcile against production that selecting an appropriate ISO value becomes quite tricky. So just very briefly, I'll just uh, sort of show you a couple of options. So the most simple but a very defendable option 
would be to select a portion of the deposit that's quite simple and straightforward and to model that manually with, with strings. And then um, to generate the indicator interpolants at multiple ISO values within the same portion of the deposit as the manual model with the same extents and then compare the volume of those models with the manual model. Um, and then the ISO shell that most closely matches the manual model would then be used for the whole deposit. Um, so another methodology would be a technique I called, uh, I've called drill hole shifting. So this is probably more robust. Uh, it considers the whole model uh, rather than just a portion, but it's more complex and a bit more difficult to explain. Um, I, I don't really have time to describe in full now, but um, basically the technique is based on the assumption that on a relatively close space drill grid, were you to uh, complete infill holes at the same spacing midway between each hole, then these would result in a similar length of intersections above the selected cutoff grade compared to the holes that have already been drilled. Um, so very briefly, that would basically involve um, initially calculating the length of the drill hole sections that are above cutoff. So the, these are all of our um, sort of assays that are above cutoff. Then take the entire drill hole set and shift it by half the average drill hole spacing. So now we've got a new set of drill holes, which are just the original drill holes shifted halfway between each. Uh, then just based on the original drilling, using all the geological controls that you defined and all of the other parameters that you defined, run the indicator shells at a series of ISO values. Then code the shifted drill hole file by each of those ISO value shells, and then calculate the, the length of the shift of drill holes inside those ISO value shells. And, um, the, thick, the total thickness of the coded drill holes, which most closely matches the thickness of the actual drill holes but the selective cutoff is the one that should be selected. I doubt anybody, that, that was far too quick, but, but if anybody wants to, uh, wants to discuss it in more detail with me afterwards, then come and grab me. Um, so, uh, so, final sort of take home messages. Um, basically, before you decide on an indicator interpolant approach for modeling, uh, take time to consider whether that approach is actually appropriate or whether an alternative modeling technique might work better. If you do decide to use indicator interpolants, always, always run sensitivity tests on the ISO value and see how much it changes. And finally, if you, if you are going to um, use an indicator interpolant approach, then make sure you use a rigorous and defendable approach to determine the ISO value. It should never just be a thumb suck or afterthought. And that is me. Thank you, James. Keep those questions coming.